Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here again in, in Montevideo. And uh, my talk will be about something which is not uh, directly related to dynamics, but I will try to make the, the relation to a kind of dynamical system that appeared in the middle. So, so the main object of my talk will be this kind of uh, things. This is the, the famous Penrose tiling, which is uh, tiling of the plane by using two, two pieces, two polygons. And the special feature of this tiling is that it is a periodic. So there is no translation of the plane that sends the tiling into itself. Okay, this was, this was not the, the first examples of, of such a thing, but I think this is the most beautiful one because it uses only two pieces. And uh, uh, well, it is still an open problem whether you can build something similar uh, using just one piece. This is the, the so-called Einstein problem. And uh, well, this is an open problem. There have been some announcement in both directions. So in the recent years, but it is still an open problem. The only thing that it is known is that, well, it is not very hard to prove that if you have a, a, a polygon that tiles the plane only in an aperiodic way, then this polygon has to be non-convex. So convex polygons, if they tile, then there is a, a, a periodic tile. And uh, well, there, is, there are many special features of this tiling. One of these is that it has somehow a um, self-similarity property. So you can build this tiling by iterating some procedure. So you, stu you start with the, with the so-called, uh, uh, this is the magic triangle. The, it is called the, the golden triangle. So, and, uh, and you take uh, the, the, the division of this triangle using uh, following the, the, the golden proportions. And then you, you get some uh, uh, configurations that if you rescale, then at the limit what you get in one of these uh, rescalings is the, is the Penrose tiling. Okay, this is one way to produce the Penrose tiling, but actually there are many others. And, uh, and as, as I said before, uh, well, this, this has been very interesting because it, it was discovered that there are real quasi-periodic tilings I mean in the real world, so the discovery of quasi-crystal in the 80s showed that this kind of uh, geometric configurations actually appear in, in nature. And, uh, but the Penrose tiling was not the first in history, and actually this is somehow an equivalent form of the Penrose tiling, and this was discovered only, uh, I think, five years ago in Iran, in a city which is called Isfahan. This is the temple Darhivam, which is from the, so I think this is from the uh, 11th century, uh, if I guess, okay? And this is, uh, uh, believe me, this is really equivalent to the Penrose tiling in a certain way. But this kind of uh, knowledge will disappear actually, and nobody knows how they produce such a thing. But actually there are many, many copies of uh, this kind of tilings in, is Faham. Okay, now uh, the mathematical object that I want to concentrate on is what, what I call the Delon set or Delonay set. So, what is the Delon set? So, keep in mind the, the, the Penrose tiling and just keep uh, in mind the, the, the vertices of the polygons that appear in the Penrose tiling and the set of vertices with the Spanish accent, sorry, <laughs> is. <laughs> is uh, what is called a Delon set, which is a, a uniformly separated and coarsely dense set. Uniformly separated means that if you take any two points, then there is a minimum distance or a, a positive uh, infimum for the distance that separates any two points in the, in the, in the set. And coarsely dense set means that almost all the plane is covered by this set, which means that there exists a row, a positive row such that uh, uh, any point in the plane is a distance at most rho of a point of this uh, Delon set. So this is the definition. This is a kind of discretization of, of the plane. And of course, you can define the, the very same thing for any metric space. So 
At the long set is uh, uh, uniformly separated, coarsely dense subset of the of the of the of the metric space you are dealing with. Okay, it's a kind of discretization of the of the space. And of course, there are uh, obvious examples. You take C two inside the plane. This is a uh, the long set. And again, in the plane, if you take the set of vertices of a tiling that uses only finitely many polygons, finitely many pieces, then of course the the well, the, 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 the infimum of the of the uh, say of the systoles of the of the of the of the of the polygon is going to be the the row and the. Uh, no, it's going to be the sigma, and the rho is going to be the diameter, diameter of the, the maximum of the diameters of the polygons. Okay, and let me go very, very quickly to the to the main question of, of this, of this. Uh, this was, uh, this is very interesting because it, it was formulated in an independent way by Furstenberg and Gromov, with very different uh, uh, motivations. First, the motivation by Furstenberg was a motivation coming from dynamics. It was related to some uh, recurrence times for some flows on the torus. And the motivation of Gromov was mostly geometric, and it came from geometric group theory. Namely, in geometric group theory, there is a very nice theorem which is not uh, uh, which is not totally uh, easy to prove is that if you, you have a, a group which is, say, by Lipschitz equivalent to C2, then actually it is C2 up to some finite index subgroup, OK? And so the question of Gromov in, in this view was very natural, is whether every the long subset of the plane is by Lipschitz equivalent to Z2, OK? There is a by Lipschitz map defined on the de long set, which sends this set of points into C2. Uh, this question was answered by Burago and Kleiner, and again independently by Macmillan. And the answer is no. There are there are uh, a strange uh, the long subset of the plane. There are the long subset of the plane that are not by Lipschitz equivalent to the to the to C two. And actually, this is very recent work by. Dimon, Kalusa, and Kopeka, uh, they, they managed to prove that this is still true for Lipschitz equivalent, which is, very, which is something very strong. So, so they, they, they managed to prove this uh, dealing with a problem coming from discrete geometry, from pure discrete geometry. And a way to restate this theorem is saying that there is no uniform bound. So let, let me write it. So there exists no. Uh, C uh, such that for every subset of C, of C2 with finite card cardinality, there exists a Lipschitz map into say let me let let me. Uh, take a, a subset of n square points, so there is no uh, uniform constant for which there is a Lipschitz map, C Lipschitz map, from uh, S into the square of length n. Let me put here. OK. And this is very, very uh, impressive because uh, uh, so you can you can you can think that this this cannot be true because if you have a, a, a set S, then this is a very a sparse set on the plane. But in order to make this set coming into the square, you have to do many things to wrap around on the plane so that the Lipschitz constant has to go to infinite. So this is a very uh, interesting work. And actually, I will try to, 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 to say a few words about the proof, because the proof is not very different from the one of uh, Burago Kleiner and Mamulen. It's a kind of technical improvement, but which is very, very clever. Anyway, so let me uh, give some concrete uh, 
uh, features about the long set. So this is, this is an exercise. If you take at the long subs subset of the plane, then it is by Lipschitz equivalent to a subset of Z2. This is very easy to see because if you have a the long set, then you make each every point on the set to correspond to the closest set point in Z2. Maybe you have to rescale in order that uh, this operation makes sense. And doing so, you get something which is by Lipschitz equivalent. Okay. Uh, the second exercise is not uh, that easy. It is not tautological. One may think that this is just a consequence of the definition, but it is not. So the image of the, the of a the long set by a by Lipschitz homeomorphism of the plane is a the long set. This is not obvious, okay? Because maybe by taking a by Lipschitz map, you can create kind of uh, uh, holes in the in the in the set. But actually, this is impossible. But it doesn't follow from the definition, I mean. OK, you have to work a little bit to. So to the line, if you forget C to C, is correct by the Yeah, uh, so. OK. OK, thank you. OK, so this is, this is for C2. So actually. Uh, OK, but the question is if on the line is correct. Is correct. Because you, you, you could uh, start creating holes in the image, okay, and and and, and at the end, the, 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 the set you get is not uh, coarsely dense, okay. But this is this cannot happen. But you need some. Well, I have some argument, somehow, uh, topological argument to do that. But thank you for the question because uh, all the things that I so I forgot to say something. So, so the question of first and Gromo makes sense in C2 because in, 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 in the one-dimensional case, this is, it is an exercise to show if you have a the long subset of the real line, then it is equivalent to Z. This is just moving points are, uh, along the line. So this is, this is uh, 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 quite elementary. So it makes sense on the plane, and actually it makes sense on ZD for every D larger or equal than two. But the proofs are mostly the same from starting from dimension two. So I will only concentrate in the case of dimension two. And actually, there is a nice open problem for coming from analysis. So there are many uh, partial results on this problem. Is whether there is every by Lipschitz map defined on, on say, on C2 uh, or any other. Uh, the long set, but actually this is already open for C2. Whether these maps can be extended into by Lipschitz homeomorphism of the plane. So whether you can, starting with something which is defined on a discrete set to, to, to extend it in, into a homeomorphism of the plane. This is an open question, okay? This is a question coming from analysis. It is known that the answer is yes, if the by Lipschitz constant is very close to one, but, uh, in general, it is open. Okay, so so here I will only concentrate on by Lipschitz maps defining on discrete sets, and I will say a few <coughs> words about this general problem for particular cases. And uh, well, what happens with the Penrose tiling is that it is not only at the long set, which is a periodic, but is it, it has a, a complementary property, which is very nice, which is almost periodic, which means that uh, uh, somehow every pattern in the tiling can be, can be uh, appears or it is copied in, in almost every part of the tiling. So the precise, uh, the technical uh, notion here is uh, what is called repetitive. So the <coughs> definition is there. You take uh, the long set and you say it is repetitive. It's for every a small r, there is a capital R such that every pattern of uh, diameter small r appears or in every ball of uh, diameter uh, capital R. OK? And this is what happens with the Penrose tiling. And this is what, uh, in general, is referred to as being uh, repetitive. And this is the, uh, a theorem that we proved some years ago with Maria Isabel Cortez, is that uh, there are many the long sets that are not by Lipschitz equivalent to Z2 in the plane, but which are repetitive. So there are some, they are something like the Penrose tiling, but they are not equivalent to Z2. 
And uh, the point is that the Penrose siding, it is equivalent to C2. And this is a theorem by, so I forgot the name of the guy who proved for the first time, but this follows from a more general theorem by Alice de Coronel and Gambodeau, which says that if you have a long set which is linearly repetitive, then it is by Lipschitz equivalent to C2. Okay, and this is the case for the Penrose siding because of this self-similarity property. And linearly repetitive means that the, in this definition above, the capital R depends linearly on the small r. Okay? If you have this property, then you know immediately that the, the, the long set is uh, by which is equivalent to, to, to the standard lattice. And the proof is very nice because it is a mixture of many, many uh, uh, arguments coming from different uh, fields. There are even partial differential equations which are solved in the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the proof. This is really very nice. And, and the point is that if you have points, then you, you, have, you have to transform this point into weight, into somehow into uh, density functions on the plane, and then you have to move a density function into another one, and this is encoded by a partial differential equation, and it is proved that in some cases this partial differential equation have solution, and then you put all the things together and you get the theorem of a list of coordinate so number. Small r and, and capital R. No, linearly is bounded above from by a linear uh, by a linear. No. Okay. okay, so it's something like uh, uh, small r is some small than something like this. It's just this. Okay, but if you if you if you change the 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 condition by say one plus epsilon, so the theorem is no longer true. Okay. Okay, and well, uh, actually uh, the, the theorem of uh, Gambodeau coronel analysis can be improved and uh, for the case of, uh, uh, well, you take a linearly repetitive the long set of the plane and actually there is a bilitious homeomorphism of the plane that sends this, this, the long set into the standard lattice, okay? So the, the open question which is, in general open for, for, for the long set, can be solved in this, in this case, and, uh, and the proof is somehow the same as the one of uh, uh, ACG, except for that you have to be, uh, you have to use all the things that are already proven and uh, to point, to remark something which is quite technical in the middle of the proof, but <coughs> there is no new idea in the proof of the, of the last theorem. Okay, but the point is that uh, we wanted to add the repetitivity to the, to the, to the construction of Burago, Kleiner, and Macmillan, and we managed to do that. And actually, to do, we managed to do that in, in, in many different ways. And it is here where dynamics appear. And the point is that you can restate the property of being repetitive in dynamical terms. Uh, First, you, you take the, the, the set or the family of the long sets of the plane, and it is naturally a, a, a metric space or a compact space, if you wish. And uh, no, not, not in general compact space, but it is, there, is a, there is a natural metric, a natural distance in the set of the long sets. So you say that, or a natural topology, you say that two the long sets are close. If when you restrict to a very big ball, then what you see are well, finite sets of points which are very close, one from the other, okay, in the, in the house of distance. And then if you, if you want this set to be closer and closer, then you pick uh, larger uh, balls and you select a, 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 an even small dist house of distance for the, for the trace of these, the long sets on the, on the, on the ball, okay? This is, a classical construction that I think goes back to Chaboti. It's in general referred to as the Grom of distance, but actually this is a much older idea. And uh, the point is that if you take, in this, this family is very large. It doesn't give a compact space, but if you, 
remember that in the definition of the Delon set, there, are, there, there, there were two parameters, the sigma and the rho, which are corresponding to the, to the, uh, the defining properties of the Delon set. And, and if you fix uh, these constants, or at least you, you, you make the, them to move in, 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 in compact sets, then what you get are compact sets of Delon sets. In particular, if you take a, a single Delon set and you, you translate this Delon set, then you get new Delon sets, but all these Delon sets move in a compact family of Delon sets. And the property of being repetitive is equivalent to that the action by translations, by R2 translations, <coughs> on, the, on this set of Delon sets uh, is minimal. This is exactly the same. It's just it's, it's really tautological. You just take the definition and you will see it's really the same. So the point of uh, our work with Marie Isabel was trying to relate the original question, the, the question by Gromov, the, 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 the geometric question, to dynamical properties for this uh, action. But actually what we prove is that there is no relation at all because you can manage to do almost uh, whatever you like, so you can make, you can construct repetitive Delon sets that are not by Leach equivalent to the to the standard set, and for which the 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 action is minimal, so because they are repetitive, and for which the action is, for instance, uniquely ergodic, and even more than that, you can prescribe any set of invariant measures, so any Choquette simplex can be realized of this as the set of invariant measure of a repetitive, non-rectifiable Delon set. So you can do whatever you like. And somehow there is no relation between the geometry of the Delon set and the dynamical properties of the translation action on the closure of this set. OK? This is the, 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 the point. OK. But what is nice here is that you can formulate this question in another way. So remind that uh, if you have a Delon set on the plane, then you can, you can move this plane, you can promote this, this, this set into a subset of C2. So that the question makes sense only for subsets of C2. And the question is whether a subset of C2, which is coarsely dense, is by Lich's equivalent to C2. And the answer is no, because of Burago Kleiner theorem and Macmillan theorem. But this question, C2 is a group, so this question can be asked for any group. So the question is, what are the groups that contain a coarsely dense subset? So coarsely dense, you take a, a group, a finitely generated group, and you take the, the word distance on the group, and you take a <coughs> subset which is coarsely dense, which means that every ball of radius, say, uh, 11, contains a, a, point in, a point in this, in this subset. Whether it's uh, such a subset can exist, which is not by Lich's equivalent to the whole group. And this is the case for C2 and for CD, because of Burago Kleiner theorem. And uh, actually, this is the case also for some solvable groups, like the Baula Solitar and so, and uh, some nilpotent groups. And actually, the conjecture is true for every nilpotent group, which is not uh, essentially Z. And this is. Uh, uh, mainly the work by Tulia Dimarts and collaborators. And uh, for the case of solvable groups, it's not that easy to, 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 to conjecture anything because for, for the case of the important group, what happens is that they are mostly realized at lattices in Lie groups. So somehow you can, you can repeat the arguments of uh, Burago and Kleiner. But for the case of solvable groups, there are many groups that are not lattices. And then uh, it is not clear what happens in general. But what is interesting is that these were examples of very small groups. And this is a necessary condition because there is a very nice theorem in the, in the thesis of Kevin White, which uh, wait, well, it says much more than this. But if you translate into this framework, the theorem of Kevin White says that if you have a, a, a group uh, with uh, coarsely dense subset, which is not by Lich's equivalent to the group, then the group is non-amenable. No, sorry, so then the group is amenable. Then the group is amenable, OK? And the reason, well, this is, this is somehow natural, because in non-amenable groups, what happens is that 
if you move from one, one ball to, to, the, to the next ball, then there are many other points that appear. So you have a lot of uh, uh, somehow volume that is being created. And moving very strictly the points, then you can manage to actually to achieve this by Lich's equivalent by just by translations in a bounded, uh, by a bounded constant. And this is an illustration of the, of the, of the theorem of Kevin White. So remember that in the plane, you take C2 and, and you take somehow randomly points in C2 and then you get a point, uh, a set, well, you prescribe a condition so that it, it is coarsely dense and then you get something which is not by Lich's equivalent to the plane. And here, if you take this uh, picture by, this is by Escher, you can do more or less the same. So there are some, uh, this is are the angels and, and devils, how, how it is called this? Yeah? Angels and devils. So you, take, you pick for every devil, you, you, you select one or the two ices, and you get at the long subset of the hyperbolic plane which is coarsely dense because you are selecting one or the two, okay? And for, for most choices, you will get something, we, we will get sets. For every choice that you make, you will get a set that is by which is equivalent to, the, to any other shoes, okay? okay? For any choice that you make, uh, you, you get something which, is, uh, which comes from a universal model. So, for instance, <coughs> the universal model could be that you pick the two ices of every devil. Okay, which is something that doesn't happen in the plane. So there is really a, a difference here. Okay, and this is uh, this is another another side of the history, and this is the key the key side, at least in the view of uh, Burak Kleiner and Macmillan, because this is not a theorem on geometry. This is a theorem on analysis. Okay, and I, and I will try to explain why. So there is a classical theorem by Rademacher which says that if you take a Lipschitz map, a Lipschitz function actually, uh, then it is almost everywhere differentiable. So this is a famous and classic theorem on harmonic analysis, which is somehow, again, this is easier in the case of uh, dimension one, but in, in higher dimension is mo more difficult. But what they prove with Aguan Kleiner and Magmullen is, 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 is a theorem on analysis that translates into the theorem on, on the on these the long sets. And the theorem is that on the plane there are positive, sorry, there is a mistake there, positive and continuous functions which are actually bounded away from zero, okay, that are not the Jacobian of a bilitis homeomorphism. Okay? And this is the theorem. And this is actually equivalent to the existence of the long subset of the plane which are not by Lich's equivalent to C2. And the reason is that when you have a the long set, what you, what you can create is somehow a density function of this the long set. And uh, then you rescale, you, you, you rescale the set and you rescale the density function. And at the end, you get some function which is continuous because it's a limit of density functions. And this function is not the Jacobian of a by Lich's homeomorphism. And then you come back and you get as a conclusion that the original Delon set is not by which is equivalent to C2. This is the way how they prove the theorem. So the proof is not constructive. At the end, they don't get a Delon set. What they get is a density function, which is not realizable as, a, as the Jacobian of a by Lich homeomorphism. And this is why they prove. So if, if you go into the paper, what you will see is uh, lots of uh, lemmas about analysis, okay? And this is a very, uh, very uh, nice theorem, and actually it's a very technical theorem because if you, for instance, if you, instead of having a continuous function, you get, you have a, a holder function, then this, this is no longer true. This is, this is a theorem by Moser. If you have a holder function, which is away, bounded away from zero and um, positive, then it is the Jacobian of a, of uh, by Lipschitz homeomorphism, okay? That is implied that you have a more stronger condition than for every set. Yes, this is somehow related to this, ah. okay? When you do the rescaling, you see, you, you translate the, the holder condition on density function into uh, a, a, a condition like this one, okay? Okay, 
So this is a very technical theorem, but what is nice, again, this is a theorem by, by Rodolfo Vieira, is that this is, well, when bad things happen, they happen gener generically, and actually this is a generic property of continuous function. If you take a positive continuous function, in general, it is not the Jacobian of a by Lipschitz homeomorphism. And actually, because of the Calusa and the other guys' uh, uh, recent theorem, this uh, you can you can replace by Lipschitz by Lipschitz, and you still get get a, theor a theorem here. Okay. And well, the, the point of comparison is the theorem of uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you have a positive function on the on the interval, then you integrate this function, you get a diffeomorphism. And the derivative of this diffeomorphism is the original function. Okay, so so what 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 this theorem says is that there is no analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus in dimension two. This is one way to say to, to, to restate the theorem. Okay, but the point is that it is this theorem that is proved by Burago Kleinen and also by McMullen. The proofs are somehow similar, but they there are some some tricky differences. But I, I, I will retain the proof of Burago and Kleiner because it's, it is the proof that is uh, uh, closer to, to our view of this thing. Well, the proof is very technical. It's really very technical. And what we did with Maria Isabel was just to restate the proof of Burago and Kleiner, which is a theorem on analysis, into a, a statement on discrete subsets of the plane. So we are trying to restate uh, the, the, uh, at least the key lemmas of the proof into, into lemmas about uh, functions defined on discrete sets and doing some coarse differen differentiation and, and things like that. These are things that are well known in, 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 in geometric group theory. But uh, well, it becomes technical, and this is an example of a lemma that you can find in our paper. I just took a, a picture of the lemma, and this is the statement. And I know it's very hard to read, but I will try to explain a little bit what is uh, in this in this statement without any any notation here. So there are many proofs of Rademacher theorem. Rademacher theorem is the theorem that says that you have something which is Lipschitz, then it is almost everywhere differentiable. Okay. And uh, but one of the proofs that I like a lot, which appears in the in the in the appendix of the Gromov book, I think it's approved by Stephen Simes, says that if you if you have something which is not differentiable, then when you take the the the, the uh, okay, I, I think this has a name, the increment. As, what is the name for this expression? The increment, the, it has a name, I think. The increment quotient. So, so the point is that when, when something is differentiable, the increment quotient converts to the same limit at every scale. So you can take here t, you can take uh, one over t, one over n, or you can take one over e to the e to the e to the n, And you, you will convert to the same limit because it is differential. Okay? And the key point uh, in, the, in the proof of uh, Rademacher theorem is that if there is no derivative, then there are some sequences of uh, scales where if you pass from one, cycle, one, one, one scale to another one, then these increments will uh, explode. Okay? This is, this is a, a, a classical idea for, for Rademacher theorem. And this is somehow what is happening here without uh, saying what is exactly uh, are these conditions. So you can see that there are some, let me, let me see. So here you can see that you are adding some m, uh, m over p, and here we are adding some m, which means that there is a change of a scale, okay? And here we are saying that if moving from this scale to this other one, uh, from one scale to another one, it doesn't change too much the increments, then there is an almost derivative, okay? 
this is this is this is the 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 the, the the, the, the statement in this theorem. So let me draw a picture to, to explain a little bit what are these, these sets here. So, uh, so here you have a rectangle. You have many squares and uh, you will compare the increments between two points here and two points here, which are at different scales. And what I am saying here is that if this is somehow m over p, and this is somehow the m in the, in the statement of the lemma. And if the increments, so what is written here is the increment at, at this scale. And what is saying this is that if the increments do not increase too much from passing this, from this small scale to this larger scale, then at the end, what you get is an almost derivative, OK? And when you get an almost derivative in a discrete setting, what you are saying is that somehow your map is like an affine and a phi map, OK? And since the, the map is somehow an affi map, then you do this, the, the, the last trick, which is the following. Well, you, now you will select your the long set, and you will put many points here and much as a quantity of points which is much smaller here and many points here. For instance, you, you, you select all the points of Z2 in this square and this square, but only a half here and so on. But what you get is that in some set, the, 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 the map is almost affine. So when you, when you look at the image, the image of this has to be very similar to the image of this. But this is impossible because here you have a quantity of points which is much larger than the quantity of points here. Okay, so this is the another another point which is very important in the proof is that at the end what you are doing is to do a very large variation of the density of the function, and this is why at the end the, the density function cannot be holder, for instance, but it is allowed to be continuous. Okay, so this is somehow the idea. This is the translation into a discrete setting. One of our main jobs here was, first of all, trying to understand Burago Kleiner paper because the, the proofs are very, are, very, are very short. At the very beginning, we were thinking that it was wrong, but actually everything is correct. Except for one sentence, which is in the paper, they, s they claim that everything can be done in the Lipsy setting but actually, uh, that way it cannot be done. And this is the, the, the recent work by Calusa and, and his co-authors. They managed to do that, but there is a very clever remark in the middle. And the clever, rever the clever remark is that the, the density function you are getting at the end is bounded away from zero. And when you integrate such a thing, what you get is not only a a Lipschitz function, with, but it is a Lipschitz function with some supplementary conditions that are well studied in, in harmonic analysis. And then you can uh, make the machine of Burago and Kleiner work again, and they managed to prove uh, the theorem for Lipschitz maps. But actually, it's an 80 page paper in GAFA, which has been published this year. But anyway. Now, the point with Maria Isabel is having this lemma, which is the discrete analog of a lemma in Burak Glainer's paper. We start with, uh, well, these two patterns. And then you, 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 we, we, we put these patterns together along this rectangle here, which is somehow the, the analog of this rectangle. And then you, you make the variation of densities here. But then you have to do this again and again. So using this, you have this rectangle. And then you build a square which is going to be the analog of this square, but in the, large, in, in, the, in the larger scale. And then you do the same, but you put a, a square with a, this density in a, in, a, in a larger square, and then you repeat the, the construction. But the point is that, the, again, the, the proportion of this length to this length is going to be unbounded in the limit. Because otherwise, you will get something which is linearly repetitive, for which uh, the coronel gambodo aliste theorem applies and so it would be uh, rectifiable. 
Okay. As I said before, we, we proved this some years ago, but actually what we, we, we would like to do is uh, something more interesting, but this is a still an open question, and this is the natural open question. Okay, but it is still open, and somehow we think that we have the ingredients to prove that it is uh, uh, such a thing, such a, as a set exists. So there, are, there is a, a classical way to produce the long sets, which are called the Catan project nylon sets. So, for instance, uh, well, this is a picture in dimension one. So, so, in dimension two, but actually it projects into something in dimension one. So you take C2, and then you get a, you put a line such that the slope of this line is irrational, and then you project the points that are, say, at this at, at most one over two to this line into this uh, into the line here. And doing so, you get a uh, delon set. Of course, here we're in dimension one, so this delon set is uh, by which is equivalent to, to, to z. But you can do the same in any dimension, okay? And the natural uh, thing to do in dimension two is you, you take a plane in dimension three, which is totally irrational, so that, uh, uh, which means that the angles do not have any kind of. Uh, uh, linearly, linear de dependence among them, and uh, then you project into the plane, you get a long set of the plane, and the question is whether this subset of the plane can be uh, non by ellipsis equivalent to Z2. Okay? So this is a very concrete open question, whether for every alpha and beta which are linearly independent. Well, linearly independence is a condition which means essentially that the the, the long set that you get is not uh, uh, has no periodicity, so it is it is a, a periodic. Okay, it is uh, a quite natural condition. And uh, and this question is open, but what is very interesting is that it seems that the answer to this question is uh, yes. I would like to say it is yes. But it is a very. Uh, uh, Sorry, if the angle is rational, when you project, you have something that is equivalent. When it's rational. When both are rational, you have something. Yeah, yeah. When one of these is right. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Of course. Of course. Of course. So yeah, because if one of them is rational, then you have in the other direction something in dimension one, then it is bilinear. And, uh, but the point is that you have rational independence uh, to get a periodicity. Uh, okay. So if one is irrational and the other is rational, so rational dependence, on one you are projecting something that is the line which is bilinear, yeah. and the other Exactly, okay. exactly, exactly. Okay, so for this problem, there is a theorem by, again, by Burago and Kleiner which says that if the angles are Diophantine, <coughs> actually, if one of the angles is Diophantine, then the, the long set, what you get, is by which is equivalent to Z2. Okay, and this is a very nice uh, result. And actually, you, you need uh, less than Diophantine, but you, you need some kind of arithmetic condition on the angle to, to make this proof uh, work. Uh, but uh, it is totally open for Liouville uh, angles, and uh, the key, the idea would be uh, trying to produce such a, such a the long set using somehow an, an approximation method, like uh, an Osof, Katoka and Osof method, something like this. So you start with, the, with sets which are actually periodic, associated to rational angles, which are very bad, uh, which convert to very, uh, which converge in the limit to, to, to Liouville angles. And then you will produce this the long set as a, as a limit of the long set, which are actually periodic, but for which the periodicity is being broken in the limit, okay? Uh, and uh, in the middle, one would be to be able to, to reproduce the Burago and Kleiner estimates in order to show that this is not by Lich's equivalent, but uh, well, this is not, uh, that easy, and uh, the point is that uh, repetitivity comes for free, okay? This is an exercise. You have something which is 
if the if the if the angles are rationally independent, then the Delon set what you get is uh, is non-periodic. So the only thing that remains to do is to select the good angles and to reprove the estimates of Buran and Kleiner to produce such a thing. Okay, we are somehow optimistic, but uh, we don't know. Maybe we are wrong on this, but anyway. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. You project on a copy of the plane or CR of the plane that you project over there. So instead of projecting on planes, which are linear objects, you project on surfaces. Yeah. And maybe you can build one of your. <sighs> Let me try to remind. I think we, we, we tried to do that, but it didn't work. But, but it is not equivalent. It's not equivalent. It, it is not an equivalent problem. And we tried to do that. Because after projecting into this surface, then you could, you could project this surface onto the plane. But it is, but it is not. So distorting. The exactly, plane. exactly, exactly. It is not the same. But uh, well, we don't know. Okay.